it's been really impossible to miss the debate and the discussions that have been going on in the province for the last however many years on this issue. And some of us are talking today and thinking about how that debate has really been caricatured into an image of two groups, one group who wants to do these kinds of renewable energy developments come hell or high water, and another group who doesn't want them under any circumstances. And, um, you know, while we may have different answers on some of the really important questions surrounding renewable electricity, the reality is that, that people in the province and people who are interested in this issue are not as polarized as we've been made to appear. If we move back from some of the positions that we, we take and are, we're committed to, to the principles that are at the core of our concerns, like ensuring public benefit, ensuring that developments are environmentally, socially, and economically sustainable, there's actually a great deal of agreement. Over the past few months, there's really been a consensus building. Citizens, environmental groups, and communities have all indicated that the way that we plan for renewable energy needs to be improved. Over the past year, uh, past half year, Kevin Institute, Watershed Watch, uh, David Suzuki Foundation on the West Coast have uh, been working together to identify common ground and to come up with a set of reforms. And we're all groups that have different perspectives and, and disagreements on some of the important issues. But we felt that it was really important to try and move past some of that debate to find a solution space to talk about better planning. What emerged from this process of consultation and discussion was a consensus on a set of basic recommendations for renewable energy planning and development. 26 different community and, and environmental groups from across the province, top to bottom and from east to west, have come together in that solution space, joining the consensus despite the differing perspectives. And because um, climate change is so urgent, renewable energy can potentially help us to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. I think people recognize that, that what planning we do do needs to be done quickly. We need to have a process that, at the same time as it's comprehensive, doesn't take years to complete. Um, our recommendations, I'm just going to summarize them, say that we can make responsible progress on renewable electricity development in six different ways. The first, and we've heard this here tonight, is that energy conservation and efficiency have to be the highest priority. Saving electricity reduces the need for new projects to meet BC's needs and can also allow for current supply and any new supply to be used to power other demands. For example, the electrification of transportation to shift away from fossil fuels. Those need to be the first priorities. 100% of the new electricity that we do use should be clean, renewable, and low impact. And of course, as we've been discussing here, the question becomes, how do we ensure that the renewable energy we generate has as little impact as possible? We think that we can do that by identifying the best and worst areas in D.C. for low-impact renewable electricity and by planning development accordingly. A strategic renewable electricity framework could be superimposed on and integrated with the existing land and resource management plans and other plans that we've heard about tonight. These plans would protect ecosystem integrity, maximize public benefit, and make planning and investment more certain for IPP proponents by establishing some of the clear no-go and go zones that we've heard about for renewable electricity projects. The process would ideally consider interrelated environmental, economic, and social factors, and include clear sustainability criteria on which to base trade-off decisions. What would those criteria be? Well, those are things that would have to be identified along with community participation in a really intense and inclusive process. And that community participation is needed to make sure that people who are concerned about their backyards have a voice in the process and can have some buy-in. In each region, maximum thresholds for environmental and social impacts could be set. But not just thresholds for impacts. We could also set goals for environmental, social, and economic indicators. The process could be kicked off quickly, maybe starting with IDP hotspot regions as a beginning and be based on a lot of the existing baseline data from land and resource management plans. Because a lot of the data is already there, it wouldn't necessarily take an overly long time to get started on some of this stuff. What it could do is, is wind up saving the province a lot of years of costly and political and even legal battles. Now, 
Now, of course, this planning would have to be done in the way that respects the constitutionally protected rights and title of First Nations, that recognizes their role as decision makers in their own territories. We think that if this were done right, if this were done effectively, the result would be some kind of a renewable electricity planning screen layered on top of the existing plans that would provide clear direction and decision making for decision making on individual project environmental assessments. This would make environmental assessment and decision making on those projects faster and more efficient. Right now, environmental assessments on IPPs are not being done in a way that inspires a great deal of public confidence. The cumulative impacts of multiple electricity generation projects along with other land and water uses, often aren't considered at the appropriate ecosystem scale or on the appropriate time horizon. Our consensus recommendations call for regional scale cumulative impact assessments for renewable energy that would flow from and be tied into the wider planning framework. Regions could be a watershed or a group of watersheds. And again, these could be scoped with community participation to account for a range of values, including both ecosystem integrity and community benefits. Once these were completed, then the individual projects that were subject to an environmental assessment could be done much more quickly because a lot of the thinking around the broader impacts would already be done. To ensure a greater proportion of those projects receive environmental impact, uh, assessment, we actually recommend um, changing the provincial law to require um, environmental assessment of projects over a 20 megawatt threshold instead of the current 50. Um, and we would want to make sure that environmental requirements imposed on these projects are respected. That there would have to be sufficient resources put into enforcement and sufficient fines put in to deter violations, intentional violations. This planning screen or framework would mean that no water licenses or land leases would be granted to operators in areas identified as no-go zones. Over the past few years, many leases and licenses have been granted to IPPs in areas that are likely ones that were trying to be inappropriate for industrial development due to ecosystem, social, and cultural impacts. Because the fees to acquire the licenses are so low, it's easy for proponents to apply for more licenses than they'll wind up using. And it makes it difficult for the public to understand or to know um, which sites are actually intended for development. The process also lacks, right now, meaningful opportunities for public and for First Nations involvement. The consensus recommendations would ensure that Crown land leasing and licensing decisions are consistent with renewable energy planning. And existing licenses and leases for projects not yet developed in areas deemed to be inappropriate in the planning process under our recommendations would be revoked. In the recommendations, priority for licenses and leases would be given to electricity projects with community or First Nations ownership with incentives being made available that would allow community control and maximize local benefits. And where that ownership was not pursued, we envisioned there being an open process with BC Hydro being free to participate. The public and First Nations would have to have meaningful opportunities to affect project plans to appeal leasing and licensing decisions. Now, just as I conclude, I want to make a few comments about uh, another question, um, export. We've been hearing tonight um, from a number of people that this province needs to have a discussion about whether we want to be involved in a large-scale export of renewable electricity. It's not a discussion that's taking place yet. And we really feel strongly that there needs to be a meaningful public dialogue about this topic that considers things like NAFTA implications, that considers things like the role BC wants to play or not in, in helping other jurisdictions move away from, from fossil fuels. That's a conversation that hasn't yet happened, and it's a conversation that our recommendations suggest needs to happen. So we acknowledge that, that our recommendations don't go as far in some respects as some people would like, but what we hoped for was to identify a common ground around a set of minimum basic requirements for responsible development of renewable electricity. A, a, a set of, of common principles that, that groups who are interested in this in the province, the government and industry, could, could think about and hopefully build on. And we hope that this discussion will be part of that. The 26 groups behind these recommendations agree, and I know that there are many more than that who also agree, that what we need is transparent, smart planning for renewable energy. 